All right, turn with me to Psalm 39. Psalm 39. <clears throat> we continue our study through this wonderful book that really is the song book of Israel. The Psalms, the song book of Israel. Now, <clears throat> let me see if I can say this in the right voice. Okay, class. Get out your pencils and papers. It's pop quiz time. <laughs> okay, that wasn't very good, but how long has it been since you've heard that? Well, for some of us, longer <laughs> than others. Didn't that used to put fear into your heart, though? Okay, class, get out your pencils and paper. So here's a pop quiz this morning as we get started in this psalm. And if you think you know the answer, shout it out. Let's talk about lifespans. Lifespans. How long does the mayfly live? Anybody? Yeah, 24 hours. 24 hours. Now, if you're from south of here, close to the lake, Lake St. Mary's, Grand Lake, then you know at certain times of the year, if you drive on 703, your windshield and your front grill are going to be covered with mayflies because they're thick, thick as thieves, as the saying goes. Mayflies, 24 hours. How about your normal, typical ant? Too long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Three weeks. The common house fly, too long. Four weeks. The common mouse, one year. One year. Okay. Switching gears, how about the humpback whale? Anybody? That's close, 45 to 50 years on average. Dolphins, 55 to 60 years. That's hard to believe, isn't it? You'd think they'd be shark food long before that. But they are, they're pretty aggressive around sharks. For sure. How about the elephant? Now, if you've noticed, what I've done in this list is what? Progressively longer, right? So I told you dolphins were 55 to 60. How about elephants? 60 to 70 years. That's a long time, don't you think? Okay, let's bring it down to where we're at. What's the average life expectancy for an American male? It is going up. 78.4. That surprised me. Now, how about for the American female? Surprisingly, 78.9. 78.9. Just a little bit longer than the male. Now, that, that was one statistic out of all this that surprised me. What's the reason for this pop quiz? <laughs> well, if you talk about each of those subjects, and especially when it comes to man, each life in the created order has purpose, and it is important. God has created everything in his creation to have purpose. Now, I know some of you are thinking, what possible purpose can a housefly have? Everything in the created order has purpose. Life is important. Now, it used to be that all of life and mankind's expressions about life took a very high view, very high view. Life was seen within the context of God as our creator. And 
Notice I said used to be. It used to be that way. Didn't matter if it was literature, art, sculpting, whatever the case was, those expressions of life always had a hint of or pointed directly to, clearly, the Creator who made us. Now, that all changed in time. It certainly isn't the case today. Life, death, eternity are not subjects that most people spend a lot of time contemplating from a higher perspective. Generally, life has been devalued to the point of being inconsequential and even in our culture, disposable. Disposable. Now, that attitude has been around for a long time. In fact, since nearly the beginning, Cain's treatment of Abel is a perfect picture of the devaluing of life. The days of Noah, if you know your, your Bible, you know what was going on during those days, remember that God's pronouncement upon that time of Noah's life is that every thought of man was what? Evil. Now, yes, that, and that's a good distinction. Every thought of man was evil continually. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. But it didn't stop there. The Renaissance and the Enlightenment that gripped Europe and the Mediterranean world, those periods are hailed as great leaps forward in the progress of mankind. But <laughs> the underlying formulations of both of those periods and the thought that were the foundations for what arose was really a belief in the autonomy of man separate and apart from God. We talk about the Enlightenment and the Renaissance as this great period of creativity. Well, it was in a certain context. But in another context, the one that we're most concerned about as Bible-believing Christians is that those periods marked a clean break in man's dependence upon God and the rise of this thinking that we don't need God. Now, that became obvious in the literature, in the art, and in the music that came out of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And I encourage you to go study the, these subjects for yourself so that you know even in greater depth and detail what I'm going to talk about this morning. That will be important for you, but just understand that the focus became not God, but nature, not God, but man, not eternity, but this life, this earth-bound existence. Now, that had some consequences. That had some children, if you will, and the philosophical, intellectual, ideological children of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment were perhaps best expressed by a man named Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin. And you may know him as the author of The Origins of the Species, or what we commonly call today evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory. And I've said this more than once, and I'll repeat it again this morning, that Darwin's evolutionary theory was nothing but an expression of a demonically inspired philosophy meant with the purpose to destroy the dignity and the high value of mankind. Now, how can you make that statement, Mike? Well, Darwinian evolution teaches that you, all people, are nothing more than an accident. We're here today because billions of years ago, there was a mutation in cells, and that spawned life, and life continued to... And if you think about this, brothers and sisters, you understand the idiocy of it. 
that on one side of their mouth they're saying man is progressing and ever being elevated to a higher status through evolution, which by the way, can only result from mutation. Name me one good example of mutation producing something beneficial for mankind. The silence is an acknowledgement that those two ideas are mutually exclusive. Darwinian evolutionary theory spawned, or at least gave the intellectual basis for abortion. That organism growing inside a woman's body, that's not a baby. It's a collection of cells. They even renamed it. It's not a human being, it's a fetus. As if that changes anything. The murderous activities of planned parenthood are a little more than Old Testament child sacrifices to Satan. That's the same thing that God condemned all of the pagan nations for, as well as Israel, offering their children in the fires of Moloch. And here's something that we need to understand, whether it was Moloch or whether it was Baal or whether it was Ashtarah or, or whatever the pagan god was named and called, those were all actual demonic spirits brothers and sisters. We think, well, those crazy people back in those days, they just worshiped stone figures and wood figures and idols. Those idols had a spirit behind them, a literal spirit behind them, a demonically controlled spirit behind them. And so I see these activities of Planned Parenthood as nothing more than the Old Testament picture of child sacrifice. Now, they try to disguise that in their vacuous terminology, choice, choice. Psalm 39 is a rebuke to such foolish, non-reflective, intellectually suicide thinking. Psalm 39 and what David writes here encourages us to consider the wonders of life, the dignity of life, the high calling that God has placed upon us as human beings. It encourages us to view the wonders of God's creation and calls us to worship the one who has made it all. Look at 39. Chapter 39, what's the first thing that you see there? You should be trained in this by now. <laughs> the superscription, <laughs> that's right. We always look for a superscription, don't we? What's the superscription, Mike? I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I hope that in your Bible, you have something that precedes Psalm 39, just after verse 22 of Psalm 38, and it may variously say something like this. Mine says, For the choir director for Jethuthan, a psalm of David. How many of your Bibles has something in there before Psalm 39, the chapter? Okay. If you don't have a Bible that has that in it, then my guess is you have a Bible that is deficient and probably is missing other things. So <laughs> I would encourage you to get a Bible that has all that was intended to be in the Scripture. When David wrote this psalm, he wrote it with a particular purpose. And that's why it says, for the choir director. What do we know by that? When the psalms say, for the choir director, what is, what is the one thing we know immediately? It was meant for public worship. For the choir director, David says, I'm writing this. This is meant to be sung in public worship for the choir director. Now, what's unusual about this superscription as compared to other superscriptions is what? We actually have a name. 
we have a name, David, for whatever reason, and I, I'm not going to try and tell you why, because I have no idea. But for some reason, David assigned this particular worship song to a particular worship leader. Now, there were many of them. You can find these in your Bibles if you'd like to look there. First Chronicles. Chapter 16, you don't need to go there now. You take notes, note takers. First Chronicles 16 gives a whole long list of worship leaders that David appointed. Chapter 25, likewise, of First Chronicles. Also, Second Chronicles chapter 5 and chapters 35. 5 and 35 of Second Chronicles also gives us some of these names of the worship leaders. And so it was meant for public worship. It was assigned to this particular worship leader. So... Let's look at the text now, starting at verse 1. David saying, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle. While the wicked are in my presence, I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good, and my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me while I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Now, you'll no doubt sense, if you've been with us through this study of Psalms, you'll no doubt sense, see the similarity of these verses with what we've already covered in the last couple of weeks in Psalm 38. That focal point of Psalm 38, you'll recall, is that suffering is real. It's real. Now, why do I say that? Well, Because some people say, well, duh, Mike, of course it's real. Well, there is a wind blowing through many churches that says suffering is an illusion. Related to that and only slightly removed is this idea that well, you're suffering because you don't have enough faith to overcome the circumstances that are causing the suffering. And there's a good Greek word for that, isn't there? And it is baloney. See, I love it. <laughs> That's exactly right. See, suffering is real. It causes many issues but it also provides a means by which our enemy attacks our faith. I don't know how many times I've seen it in my Christian life in trying to encourage someone who's going through quite the ordeal. I think the goal in the suffering as far as our enemy's viewpoint is to shipwreck your faith. Clearly to try to destroy your faith. Because remember, the scripture says that our great enemy comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah, he wants to destroy your faith. Now, when we're suffering, we're also weak emotionally. We need to just accept that fact that when we're going through an ordeal, we are not as strong emotionally as we are when things are going right. And don't think that you're somehow strange because you experience that, because that is a human condition. We all respond and react that way. Now, I appreciate my brothers and sisters who seem to have a, a resolve of steel, and they don't blink in the face of suffering and ordeals and trials. But that's not me. <laughs> It affects people. It affects us in very real ways. Note here in verse 1 that David says, I will guard my ways as with a muzzle. Now, you know that I like just chewing on the text and chewing on it and looking at it and what's the words and why is he saying this compared to that and how does that follow from this? And I hope you're doing the same thing. So as I was chewing on this, 
I'm wondering this question. How does guarding our ways, notice, I said I will guard my ways. How does guarding our ways help us to guard our mouth? Isn't that what he says? I will guard my ways that I, or so that I, may not sin with my tongue. So how is it that our behavior affects our speech? That's an interesting question, don't you think? <laughs> well, you know I'm prepared to give you an answer, right? <laughs> how can guarding our ways help us to guard our mouth? which in turn keeps us from sin, because that's what he's saying here, that I may not sin with my mouth. Hmm. Most times when we begin to practice sinful behaviors, let's think about that for a moment. When we begin to practice sinful behaviors, we do so, if you're a believer, we do so with a conflicted conscience. Don't you think? Think about the last time that you were in that situation where you kind of waded into a behavior or followed a decision to do something, and yet the whole time your mind was screaming at you. You know that's a good thing when your mind tells you don't go there. It's really a good thing when your mind tells you, I wouldn't say that if I were you. <laughs> we call that the five-second rule, right? How many of us observe the five-second rule with any kind of regularity, or do we just blow through that <laughs> warning? <laughs> you know, not everything that comes here needs to come out here. <coughs> it's okay to keep your thoughts to yourself. Guys, Commit that to memory. <laughs> That's not to let women off the hook. I'm not saying that. Because I've seen some pretty mouthy broads over the years, believe me. I've <laughs> and and they they <laughs> chances Chances going, what's a broad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that, I, I said that by way of illustration. <laughs> yeah, you're paying attention now, right? <laughs> uh, our behavior will eventually affect our speech. When we wade into behavior that is sinful, if you're a believer, your conscience is screaming at you. But actually, your conscience is what? It's another name for the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will never lead you into error. So if you've drifted into error, it's because you're ignoring the Holy Spirit in your Obeying the what? Flesh. You do it because you want to do it. Apologies to Flip Wilson. But the devil don't make you do everything you do. He plays a big hand in it, but listen. Too many times we just go along because we want to go along. We do it because we want to satisfies the flesh, makes us feel good until the bill comes due. See, the battle over sin is lost. We've completely become captivated by it. When our tongue, when we start using our mouth to justify our behavior, we've crossed over that threshold. Notice David here in this in this uh, passage says what he says about this it's in a context 
It's in a context. He says, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle. Here's the context. While the wicked are in my presence. While the wicked are in my presence. How very important it is that we maintain our testimony. You know this is true. You've probably said it yourself. But lost people watch saved people all the time. Now, they don't want you to know that they're watching you. And by the way, why are they watching you, brother, sister? Why do lost people watch you? Do you know? You ever thought about it? They're trying to see if what you say is really what you believe. And what is the litmus test to determine if what you say is what you believe? What is it? It's what you do. <laughs> it's your actions. It's your behavior. Because you can preach all day long at somebody that if you live exactly the way you're telling them not to, which are they going to believe? Your actions. That's why we come up with all these catchphrases. Actions speak louder than words. Or the updated version is, I hear you talking the talk. <laughs> and what's, what follows from that? <laughs> Let me see you walk the walk. Talk cheap. Back in my day, the saying was, words are a dime a dozen. <laughs> I'll believe you and what you say when I see you living it. I mean, how, many as, uh, how many of us as parents have said that to our children? One of the most heartbreaking things that I think I've ever heard is a lost person justifying their sin by claiming that another believer wasn't concerned about it, so why should you be? The world is watching, brothers and sisters. They're watching your life. They want to know if this God that you claim to serve is the same God that's going to help you through the trial. If it's the same God that's going to help you not to stand there and listen to racy jokes, filthy, vulgar language. If you have a hard time and you're squirmish about what other people think about you and you kind of sit there or stand there in a group when somebody's saying something that clearly is ungodly and you kind of snicker or smile, try this once because I guarantee you it'll change the entire environment and it'll give you a testimony because I've done it. I don't have to do it anymore because people don't talk like that around me. But way back when, when I was a brand new Christian, people used to try and, did you hear this? Did you, did you hear the story about, and, and they'd start down, and I'd stand there and look at them until the first thing came out of their mouth that was ungodly, and I'd do this. I'd just turn around and walk off. You don't need to say anything to them. Your behavior demonstrates everything that they need to know. I'm not going to stand here and listen to that. I don't think it's appropriate. It's ungodly. And I'm not going to allow that in my ears. I'm done. I'm out of here. And you've said all that by turning around and walking away. Now, just in case some of you think, well, you're a pastor. What do you know about that? <laughs> I've worked my entire life in factories, office buildings, I rub elbows with people every day. Now, most of you know that. So I know what goes on in those contexts. I lived that. I lived the factory life for many years. And I know that you can maintain a testimony even in that environment. So David says in verse 2 then, I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good 
and my sorrow grew worse. David says, I acted as if I was deaf and mute towards sinners rather than sin in their presence. I acted as if I didn't hear it and I didn't see it rather than sin in the presence of the wicked. But I want you to notice something here, and I'll point this out, because we can carry that too far. Sometimes there are opportunities to open our mouths and say something in the midst of a context that may, might make us uncomfortable. Sometimes there is an opportunity to say something. Here we could see that perhaps David carried this a little bit too far, and and. When we do that, we can actually thwart what God may be trying to do. Because notice David says, I was mute and silent. I was deaf and mute. I refrained even from good. Now, that could be problematic. Now, there is a context that we, I guess that could capture this thought. We're commanded in the New Testament not to cast our pearls before the swine, right? Right? And I think in context, what that passage is talking about is that when somebody is continually hostile to the gospel and you've shared Jesus and you've shared salvation and you've shared the gospel story repeatedly with them and they continue to say, I don't want to hear that stuff. Get away from me. How many times do I need to tell you that? We are not commanded any place in the scriptures to stand and take abuse, to stand and just take hostility from people. In fact, when Jesus sent out the disciples, the 70 disciples, two by two, he said, hey, when you enter a city or a house and they receive you, stay there for as long as they'll have you. What was he talking about there? If they're open to hearing the gospel, stay there as long as you can and continue to share the gospel. Well, what did he say about those places that would not receive you? Shake the dust off your feet and move on because there's too many other people that will be receptive. Now that evolved into the fields are white and to harvest. We're not meant to stay and put up with stuff, but we can also be carry that too far is my point. He says, I refrained even from good, he says. Now, God can and often does want to use you in difficult circumstances. Why? Have you ever thought about that? Lord, because in the least, we have to admit that trials and tribulations come to us by God's leave, right? He, in the least, allows them. You understand that no circumstance of life that comes upon us, God doesn't say, wow, I didn't see that coming. There's nothing that surprises God. He knows what your tomorrow holds. He knows what your afternoon holds. Every trial or tribulation that we find ourselves in, in the least, we have to say God allowed it. And if God allowed it, we know by the promise in the New Testament, if God allows a trial or a tribulation in your life, that he's going to use that for good. Now, I know some of you are thinking, I, I, I can't see any good that could possibly come out of this circumstance. Well, there's a reason for that. <laughs> You're not God. See, God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows every little thing, Every little thing. Nothing escapes God's notice. Not one little thing. We're talking about the God who created you, who thought of you even before you became a baby in your mother's womb. He knew you. He knew what you are today before you were even formed. He knew what two people to bring together, man and woman, in marriage to create you. <laughs> he had his finger on the whole thing. I like the one in the scripture that says, he knows every hair on your head. 
He has less to count with me these days, but <laughs> the point is well taken. He even knows that detail about you. That's an amazing thing, don't you think? God often wants to use your circumstances. And we, when we build that emotional wall around us, that I am not going to do anything, even those things that might be good, David says, God's got to dismantle that. Do you know you're not useful to the kingdom when you build walls around yourself and refuse to participate in kingdom work? And by the way, the day you were born again was your marching orders to participate in the kingdom work. <laughs> How many times have you heard me say this? We all have jobs to do in building the kingdom. Everybody is a kingdom builder if you name the name of Jesus Christ. And what a glorious thing that is. And here's what I love. One of the things I love about God and his kingdom work is it has such a variety <laughs> I mean, look around, brothers and sisters. We've grown to love each other because we are called together to be a body, part of the body of Christ that's called, we're just the Calvary Chapel Lima branch of the body of Christ. But look around. How could such a variety of people all come together if this was really just of our own doing? Here's a newsflash. We wouldn't. I know most of you and your backgrounds and your stories and what you've come through that's brought you to this place today, only God can do that. Now, notice the result of what happens when we kind of circle the wagons and we become deaf mute and we're not going to get involved and we build this wall and all this kind of stuff. Notice what happens in verse 2. I was mute and silent. I refrained even from doing good. And my sorrow grew worse. <laughs> Why do people build walls up and try to get out of participating in what God's calling you to participate in? Why do we do that? And then things get worse, and then we go, Why are you doing this to me, God? Or am I the only one that's ever done that? There is an unmistakable sign that your chosen strategy is in error. If you circle the wagons and things get worse, I mean, the whole point of circle the wagons is to protect yourself, right? Well, if things don't start to get better, they actually start getting worse. Hello, McFly. <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> your choice of strategy is the wrong choice. Why are we so thick and slow sometimes to grasp what God is doing? So David is rethinking his circumstances. That's verse 3. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned. Now, that's an old-fashioned word, musing. Musing simply means thinking. Thinking, musing, pondering, contemplating, thinking. And by the way, that's where we get amusement. Amusement. Now, I am not going to follow that rabbit trail, but I am going to say this. Amusement, be very, very, very careful as a believer about what you define as amusement or another word that is used probably more today, entertainment. Now, I'm willing to go out on a branch and say that about 95% of everything that's on television today is trash. And to define it as entertainment, especially when we get to prime time, the evening hours, let's take a quick inventory. Wait a minute, I said I wasn't going there. I cannot pass up an opportunity. <laughs> Abortion. Rape, murder, drug dealing, lying, stealing, adultery. 
Did I miss any of the big ones that prime time television glorifies? Huh? Homosexuality, fornicating. Now we could go on, but here's the point. People, even Christians, and this just blows my mind, they'll sit down in the evening and relax, and they want amusement or entertainment. So they turn on the TV, and they watch a continual visual demonstration of all of those things that God condemns in His Word, and we call that entertainment. The Bible says that we are to think on higher things, those things that are pure, those things that are right, just, holy. How, do we, how did we get to a place, even Christians, where they think that's entertainment? My point, before I follow the rabbit trail just a little bit, so now I'm coming back. My point is this, amusement, break it down, do your word study, amusement, break it down, ah, muse, ah, means no, muse, thinking. <laughs> amusement is not thinking. Now, we know that's true because we say, I'm just going to be a couch potato, and what does that normally involve? The television. When we say, I'm just going to sit down and veg out, what does that normally involve? The television. We're allowing all these things that God condemns to come into the gateways of our soul, what we call the eyes and the ears. And then we wonder why things are so screwed up in our lives. You're being indoctrinated. You're being taught that these things are normal, so why can't you accept them? So David here is rethinking his strategy. My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned, so things didn't get any better when I was doing the things that he's talking about in chapter 2. And he says, then, after all of this, then I spoke with my tongue. Then he opened his mouth up. Then he opened his mouth up. But notice he had learned. Because he didn't open his mouth up to the wicked. He didn't open his mouth up to other believers. He didn't open his mouth to a trusted friend. Who did he open his mouth up to? Verse 4, first word, Lord. David came to God. David sought God's counsel. Brothers and sisters, there is a message there that I could not exhaust in the time that I have left this morning. Who must we always run to first? God. Always run to God. And you talk about an attitude adjustment. This verse, verse 4, as I consider this entire chapter, this verse is a jewel in the entire chapter. Notice what he says. Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Wow. That just bursts onto the scene from this whole conversation that we're engaged in here in Psalm 39. That is like a foghorn in the night. David is a very wise person. In fact, wise is the man or woman who understands that our days are numbered and that each day is a gift. Each day we wake up and draw breath, it is a gift of God. It is a miracle. He kept you through the night. He's given you another opportunity to live a life that brings glory and honor to Him. 
And that really is an amazing thing. David has a change in perspective, if you will. Now, we call that an attitude adjustment. But through all of this, he has shifted his perspective. Now, perspective is a very wonderful thing. Perspective is a valuable thing. It's the ability to understand something because you have acquired a frame of reference. That's what it means to have perspective. I didn't say a perspective. <laughs> I meant to have perspective. You've acquired a frame of reference. In a spiritual sense, perspective means seeing life from God's point of view. How very, very valuable and important life-altering it is to begin to understand and begin to see life from God's perspective and not our own. See, in the Bible, the words understand, wisdom, discernment, all of those words have to do with perspective. It has to do with perspective. Now, the opposite of perspective in the Scriptures is hardness of heart, blinded, dullness of thinking. Psalm 103, 7 says, God made known His way to Moses, His deeds to the people of Israel. Did you catch that difference? God made known His ways to Moses and His deeds to the people of Israel. You see, the people of Israel got to see what God did, but Moses got to understand why God did it. That's perspective, understanding. That is the difference between knowledge and perspective. Knowledge is learning what God has said and done. Perspective is understanding why he said and did it. Do you understand that that's every Christian's calling? Perspective answers the questions of life. All of those questions that we ask, and people ask all the time, having the proper perspective provides the answer because you understand why God did it. It gives you a fresh look. The Bible says that unbelievers have no spiritual perspective, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, for you note-takers, look that up. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The Apostle Paul says, hey, people without the Spirit cannot understand the things of God because they are spiritually appraised and they, it is impossible for them to understand. They're foolishness to them. Why is that? Because they do not have the Holy Spirit living in them. You see, the gift of the Holy Spirit was given for so many reasons. One is for an understanding of the Scripture an understanding that goes beyond just, okay, it says this, but why? It answers the why question. Likewise, a, a lack of perspective is a mark of spiritual immaturity. Note takers, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, chapter 13, chapter 14. So in contrast, having perspective is evidence of spiritual maturity. And when you have perspective, brothers and sisters, <laughs> you are growing in maturity. That's what the writer to the Hebrews said. Hebrews 5, 14, for your note takers, says this, Solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Part of the maturing process is acquiring perspective, understanding who this God is and why he does the things that he does. Now, there are many benefits to grasping this principle. And so our challenge is to learn to see life from God's perspective, right? So let me give you four things, four things quickly that I want you to understand about this. 
And while we do this, let me give you the scripture that I'm using to support this. So turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, amen, when you're there. This challenge that we have before us, if we really want to mature and grow in our understanding of who God is, then we need to get a proper perspective on life, what it is, what it's meant to be, all that it can be, the wonders and the glory of it. Look with me, beginning at verse 13, where the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Read that again. Every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Brothers and sisters, I've said this before. You've heard me say it. I can't tell you how many times. Ethnicity, nationality, race, those are all constructs of man meant to keep us divided. Let me say that again. Ethnicity, you can call it nationality, religion, race, are all constructs of man meant to keep us divided. When God looks at the creation, he sees the creation. <laughs> he sees people that he created. God issues his call of salvation to every man and woman, regardless of what? Race, creed nationality, ethnicity. He doesn't care. He's calling the world to himself. Every family in heaven and on earth derives its name from God, our creator. That he would grant you, verse 16, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, what is that? Who is that? That's the Holy Spirit. Don't think this is some pie in the sky. Oh, we can't do that. That's impossible. No, you have the Spirit of God in you, and God calls us to that. That is our mission as Jesus' followers. And then he concludes with this. Verse 21, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That means today too, brothers and sisters. You see, here's the point. Perspective causes us to love God more. Perspective causes us to love God more. The better we understand the nature and the ways of God, the more we love Him. The more we see that He has broken down every barrier between man and Himself, the more we love Him. The more we wonder at what He does in our lives corporately together, the body of believers, and what we see Him doing in other body of believers, causes us to be in amazement. It's easy, real easy, to be dis depressed and in despair today. As we look out across the world and we see everything that's happening, we think, 
Yikes. <laughs> Jesus, is it time for you to come back? <laughs> and some of us, okay, me, I think it's overdue. How long, O Lord? Like the saints we read about in Revelation under the altar, the martyred saints crying out, Lord, how long will you wait? Well, here's the answer to that. You know there is an answer to that question. How long, O Lord, will you wait before you return? There is an answer, and here's the answer. He's returning when the last person that he has called is saved. When the last person says, I trust you, Jesus. Your finished work on Calvary's cross, you paid my penalty. That was my death, and you took my place. Oh, oh, forgive me and cleanse me and live in me and direct my steps, Lord Jesus. When that last person that Christ has called utters those words, he is coming again. And look up brother and sister, because <laughs> when Christ comes back, he's coming back for his bride. Do you understand that? He's coming back for the bride. And if you trusted in Christ and salvation, you are part of the bride. We already have our wedding clothes. You just can't see them right now, right? What are our wedding clothes? The righteousness of Christ. Robes of righteousness. You go into Matthew 13 and some of those other parable chapters and it talks about that the king sent out his servant to invite the guests to come in. And remember there was one that tried to sneak in without the wedding clothes? And the king said, what are you doing here? <laughs> what was he saying? You don't belong to me. This is the marriage supper of the lamb. Where are your wedding clothes? I.e., the robes of righteous, robes of Christ. Where are yours? And they threw him out. That was a teaching that demonstrates nobody gets into heaven by their own works. We'll only see Christ face to face because we have his righteousness. That's the admission, right? First point then is Perspective causes us to love God even more. Secondly, perspective helps us to resist temptation. You see, when we have a proper outlook, proper attitude about things, it really doesn't matter what you're going through. You can fill in the blank. If we have the proper attitude, proper perspective, proper understanding, it helps us to resist temptation. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but the way thereof leads to death. We can resist temptation. No temptation has overcome you, but such as is common to man, right? And I know sometimes we make a big deal out of our temptations, right? Oh, I can't bear up under this God. Why did it take it away from me? What's the word say? The word says, with the trial, he will provide a way of escape. Sometimes it is incumbent upon us to merely hang on. Because notice in that passage of Scripture, and I've had to point this out a number of times over the years to people who say, well, why does God do this? And I can't do it. Listen. Listen. God doesn't say, especially in that passage, that he's going to help you go around the problem. Very seldom does God offer detours in life. <laughs> he wants you to stick to the main highway. And sometimes that highway goes right through a storm. But God says, if you'll hang on, if you'll trust, we're going to be fine because I'm providing the way through it. 
And sometimes we need that for our spiritual growth, don't we? Sometimes we need to trust him. Sometimes we get kind of spiritually, I don't want to call it lazy, but we're used to kind of handling our problems, you know? We're type A kind of people, and problem comes, we're going to handle it, and especially guys. And, I, and Well, I'll just pick on myself. I'm one of those people, don't come to me and share your problems unless you want a detailed plan, step by step, about how you're going to overcome it or get through it. But I've learned over the years that when my wife comes to me and she says things, she's not asking for a detailed plan step by step through it. I just want you to listen. And I've gotten better at that, just listening. But I'm often on the edge of my seat ready to offer if she says... <laughs> Perspective help us to resist temptation. That's, that's the second point. Perspective helps us to handle trials, and I've kind of talked about that already. Do we have God's perspective on life? We realize that the words of Romans 8.28 are true. For I know <laughs> that all things work together for good. And what's the context? For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Brother and sister, if you're a born-again believer, then God has called you into a relationship. And all trials that you experience, he will that's a promise. He says, I will work for good. Now, does that mean that you just sit back, you know, like, uh, what was that guy? Don't even remember now. There was a movie flash there for a second. Kevin Costner, Dances with Wolves. Anybody see that movie? Okay. Well, he was going to sacrifice himself, right? We found out they were going to amputate his leg. He said, oh, no, you're not. I'm not going to live like that. So he jumped on back of that horse, and he was just going to ride right in front of the enemy lines. And he actually had his arms out. I think they were trying to say, you know, a Christ figure. And I thought, but anyway. And they were taking shots at him, and nobody hit him. Five-second rule. I'll tell you later. Ask me, and I'll tell you what I was thinking. <laughs> That'll be one-on-one, -on -one, though. <laughs> the testing of our faith develops perseverance, James 1, 3. The testing of our faith develops perseverance. And so that's the third point. A proper perspective helps us to handle trials. It really does. It, it helps us to cope and deal. And then finally, the fourth point, and we're out of time this morning, so I'll give you this one, and then we'll close. Perspective protects us from error. Perspective protects us from error. Now, I'm going to read another passage for you note-takers. It's, it's Ephesians 4. 11 through 16, and here's what it says. And he, God, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Why? Well, that's the next verse, 4, verse 12, or because. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. See, talking about perspective here. To a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Man, I could preach a sermon on that verse. 
That's got a lot of meat right there. But I'll finish. 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but for instead speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, that's all of us, we all have a part, according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself, how? In love. Perspective protects us from error. And if there was ever a time, brother, sister, that we need to be protected from error, it's today. Do you know that the misinformation that's out there today, literally, it's breathtaking to me. And I've said this before, if you're getting your information, if you think you're getting reliable information from your television, please don't do that. But don't be so gullible like the other people that say, well, it was on the internet, it must be true. No, <laughs> but there are reliable news sources that you can go to and find out what's really going on. Do you know the American news media, they suppress and sanitize all news? Do you understand that you're only hearing what corporate media wants you to hear? Do you understand that? Do you understand that in today, America today, there are are six, count them, six corporations that own the top 50 largest media outlets, be they radio, television, newspapers. Six. You often wonder why the media in America has the same message. No matter where you go on TV, it's the same message. It's like the same drumbeat. Well, hello. They're owned by only six corporations. And what do you know about corporations? I know, I'm following a little rabbit trail. What do you know about corporations? Corporations have a vested interest, right? And that vested interest is number one, what? Make money. <laughs> Make money, yes, it is. I'm not saying there's anything evil about that, but what I am saying is this. If their number one priority is making money, they're very interested in the message that you hear from them. And it must always, what? Present any narrative or script in the proper light. Why would that be a motivation? Because they're making money to present it in a certain script. Perspective. It's very important, folks. Not just when it comes to living the Christian life, not just when it comes to understanding the Scripture, perspective is important in living, period, in an age of disinformation. You've got to know what's true. And there's a way to do that. We will pick up this study next week at verse wherever we were at. Three or four, something along there. And we will continue with this teaching on the brevity of life. Why do we need to understand life the way that God wants us to understand it? Well, I hope that you understand it will change your life. If you can comprehend God's perspective, if you can make God's perspective your perspective, it'll change your life in every area. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy toward us. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for teaching us by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that we would gain a proper perspective on all of life. It is valuable. It is important. You have created us, and you declared, Lord, that your creation was good. What more than that do we need? Father, help us to live our lives each day with our testimony in mind, because, Lord, that reflects directly upon you. Thank you for this body of believers, Lord, that you continue to cause to persevere, that you continue to equip, 
that you continue to provide an anointing of your Holy Spirit upon. Help us to stand firm and strong in the day and age in which we live. Father, draw people to yourself and bless us, Lord, by allowing us to participate in their discipleship. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.